Welcome to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. I'm your host, Tim Reed. And once again, I'm so excited to be here, and I want to say thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. Now, we're just about at the end of season three. I mentioned last week that today's episode is the second to last episode of the season, and I'm blown away that that three seasons of this podcast are almost complete, and trust me, I do not take for granted the platform and the audience that is listening to this. I'm just convinced that you guys are the future of our industry and you are the leaders that are going to carry us forward. So thank you for listening and this has just been an incredible season for me. I feel totally, totally blessed. Now, before we get started, there's a couple housekeeping announcements that I want to give you. And the first one is this, is that we are actually going to host a live podcast meetup on Wednesday, March 11th in New Orleans. Now, this is going to be super, super fun. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get together on Wednesday, March 11th from 5 to 6 p.m. at public belt and this is a bar that's on the second floor of the hilton riverside in new orleans and this is going to be a social hour to get together have a drink and connect with other people who are like-minded listeners of the podcast and you know for me this is going to be just a great day so like i mentioned in last week's episode on wednesday me and grant have a four hour block of classes that we're going to be doing back to back to back to back now grant's last class gets done at four o'clock so if you're going to be in those classes that gives you an hour to move over to this bar which is right next to the convention center and then from five to six we can hang out and get to know each other i'm dead serious when i say that this podcast is growing a community and I'm really stoked for us to get the chance to meet face to face and I can tell you right now that there's even going to be some guests from the podcast that are going to be making an appearance here I mean obviously I'll be there we're going to have Grant Falco there as well and rumor has it that Tim Rethlake himself is going to show up so I hope to see you guys there it's going to be a really fun time and hopefully this is just the first of many meetups that we have in the coming years Okay, so moving on, I want to talk a little bit about next week's episode, which is going to be the last episode of season three. And in the same vein as the first two seasons, we are going to have the last episode of this season be a Q&A episode. So I've been collecting questions for about the last six months, and I'm sorting through all of them, and we are going to land on ones that best represent the questions of everybody, and we're going to answer them next week. One of the things that's going to be cool is that I'm going to be doing this episode over an Instagram live session with Grant Falco. So we're going to jump on Instagram live. We're going to do a video chat and you're going to get to hear both of our opinions on the answers to these questions. And I think it's going to be super, super fun. So if you want to find out the date and the time that that's going to be happening next week, you can jump onto Instagram and go follow me. My Instagram handle is fireside. Tim, and I'm going to announce the date and the time shortly. But either way, the episode next week is going to be amazing. I love the Q&A episodes, and they're some of our highest rated. Now, the last thing I want to announce before I start talking a little bit about this episode is... I mentioned 2020 has been getting booked up for me, and I wasn't able to announce this a few weeks back, but now I'm able to. It's in the books and confirmed that we are actually going to be doing a fire time tour in 2020, and the first dates of this are going to be April 6th, 7th, 8th and 9th. And this is going to be out in New England. And I'm stoked because I'm going out there and Northeast HPBA is putting together a circuit of different cities that I'll be going to to speak on sales, marketing, and leadership in this new landscape of business that we're in. So the cities that we're going to be hitting are these. We're going to be hitting Manchester, New Hampshire, Plymouth, Massachusetts, Southington, Connecticut, and Newburgh, New York. Now, I cannot wait. I think this is going to be just an amazing trip, and I love that it's going to be to multiple cities. So if you're anywhere in that New England area, I would love to get a chance to meet you and see you at one of these events. And also, as more events start popping up for 2020, I'll make sure to plug those on the podcast so that you can come out if you're in the area. Now, as we jump into the conversation today, this is with my friend Pete Schoenfeld. And 
I'll give you an introduction to how we met at the very beginning of this interview, but Pete is a friend who sits on the national board of the HPBA with me, and he's someone that I have a ton of respect for seeing the way that he approaches sales, the way that he approaches leadership, and what he's doing out at the company he works for in Denver, Colorado, regarding the customer experience and how they're thinking about business a little bit differently. So, We were in Washington, D.C. a couple months ago for a board meeting, and one night we're hanging out talking, and we're just going back and forth about the state of the industry and what businesses need to be thinking about, and as we're having this conversation, like it was long, it was intense, it was heated at different times, and I was like, dude, Pete, we got to do a podcast episode about this, and so for this conversation, I, I had no questions prepared. I literally just called him up. And we had a conversation about the state of the industry. So I'm really excited to play this for you. I think it's extremely authentic and genuine. And my hope is that this kindles some kind of desire for you to get involved and start thinking about how we can take our industry forward. So with all that said, I can't wait for you to hear this episode with Pete. As always, we'll circle back at the end and talk about it. But in the meantime, get out a pen and paper and be thinking about What can I do to help take our industry forward? Joining me from Denver, Colorado is the Senior VP at Fireplace Warehouse. I'm joined by Pete Schoenfeld. Pete, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Tim. Thanks for having me on. Hey, my pleasure. I'm excited to have you on the show today. And this is an interview that we've been talking about for a little bit. When we were back in DC a couple months ago, we kind of started to lay out like, what would it look like to have a conversation about the state of the industry? And I'm really excited about it. Yeah, me too. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, Pete, so for people that aren't familiar with you, let's give some history to your time in the industry. Now, we first met at a bar. I don't want to know what time of night it was. Like probably pushing one thirty in the morning in New I Orleans. <laughs> in New Orleans, like, I don't know, three years ago. And I blame Don Pierce for introducing us, right? Yes, absolutely. Don Don was definitely the catalyst there. Yeah. And so and so I remember we had an awesome conversation because it was late at night. You know, we've been out at dinners and parties and events And we immediately started talking business where, you know, I felt like we really connected and it's been cool to see that relationship grow. Yeah, I think the same thing, Tim, because it was more of that openness towards each other and and willingness to discuss things that may be a little bit taboo uh, for some people in the industry. And I think that was uh, that instant connection was was because we were both just, you know, totally transparent and just had real questions, legitimate questions. Yeah. and, And I think that really you hit it on the head that. The conversation was about transparency, and the truth is that no one does everything right, and there's pros and cons to every single brand out there, and if you understand the weaknesses of a certain brand, and your brand has strengths in those areas, then you're going to be able to win, and I think actually being in touch with the weaknesses of the products that you sell gives you honesty and humility when you're talking to customers too. Yeah, you have to know, you have to guide the customer to really what makes sense for them. And that might not be your meat and potatoes line. That might be a fringe line that you don't sell a ton of, but it might be the exact fit for what that customer needs. And you've got to be willing to say, I'm going to help the customer more than anything. Above everything else, I'm going to take care of the customer and they're going to get what they need in their home. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's where that came from because we talked about a lot of different lines. It wasn't just one or two at that, uh, you know, at that time. It was giving the, best product at the end of the day. Yeah. So Pete, I want to back up and I want to hear your story of kind of what brought you to where you are now because you're doing some cool things out there in Denver. Yeah. So I started in the industry, uh, kind of unknown into the industry because I was with Ferguson Enterprises in uh, Des Moines, Iowa at the time and and, uh, did a part of an acquisition team, moved from Austin, Texas to Des Moines. One of those corporate uh, things where they tell you uh, it's Tuesday, they take you to lunch, they say, an off- we have an offer you can't refuse, and on Saturday, <laughs> you're living in Des Moines. And I was like, I can't spell Des Moines, much less move there. Yeah. Uh, but it, w- it was a great opportunity. It was a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to do an acquisition there, and they happened to sell hearth products and did quite a bit of them. And um, we moved and sold more fireplaces through there than I probably did the first five years of really being in the hearth industry. Wow. It was amazing because it was something that was hard. Um, nobody understood the venting. I, I think everything, every struggle I can think of that still happens today with a new employee was happening to me yeah. uh, back then and, that, and way back then. And then uh, I moved to uh, Colorado with Ferguson and then um, decided to get into the hearth industry and went to work for a great gentleman, uh, Pete Dines at uh, 
Home and Hearth Outfitters in, in Denver and really captured my um, attention into the industry and especially HPBA and what it could do for us as a small dealer at the time, uh, one store. And it just opened my eyes and, and he really led the way in getting me into the into the industry. And, um, you know, I, I've loved it ever since I got into it. It's, it's just something I, I have always been passionate about this industry since the, the day I got into it and really got involved. Okay. And so you went from there to AES? So, yeah. So they actually, there, there's a pit stop in Chicago <laughs> in there for about six okay. years at a plumbing company. Uh, but then from there to AES as a Rocky Mountain uh, sales uh, rep. Oh, okay. Okay. And so then you went from AES to Fireplace Warehouse. Yeah, uh, I, uh, Fireplace Warehouse was actually my largest account at AES, and uh, the CEO uh, Joe Womack just kept uh, trying to get me to come over. Kept getting me to come over. Really um, thought I could help them, and I, I, I thought I could as well. And when we got the opportunity to make that move, um, you know, we we really sat down. It was probably you know almost a, a year in, in in different conversations, and I thought it was uh, just something I could really get sink deep into really do take the deep dive into helping you know have a hearth dealer be something that i thought it could be which is a distributor dealer multi-channeled uh in the hearth industry which i thought is the future still think is the future of how to survive in the hearth industry yeah i i think that there's something to that for sure but you and me are actually in pretty similar positions i think about this a lot actually like you know you're in a situation where you had some experience before that and you are coming into a business that has had some big success but is really looking for someone to fine-tune the systems and processes to build something that is bigger than any one person is that fair absolutely and it, it, it is so so big to, to think about when you're changing it, it it's it is not one individual I, I you know there's not one concept or, or, or plug and play uh, thing that I brought to the com- uh, to the company I think we brought a bunch of cohesion to the group uh, people uh, we hear about Jim Collins all the time on the yeah. podcast but it's true getting people in the right seats doing yeah. the right job and doing it the right way um, you know process and procedures is still something Tim we, we deal with every single day yep. um, we continue to fine-tune those what what worked last quarter may not work this quarter. You yeah. know, every, we're finding out that every quarter you almost have to be down to the quarter by how you rearrange your your install crews or your resources or your spend on advertising. Everything has to be flexible and you got to be willing to adapt to the changes in the environment. Dude, that's so good. And and it's funny you, you talk about that now as we're recording this, we're in the heart of the busy season. And I, I've been finding the same thing that goals and objectives and even ways that I manage my team they they really do change quarter to quarter and it, and it's super hard as a leader when like you've got ideas you know which way the bus should go to not just plow on and leave your people behind but i think that it does take humility to do this well and realize that i actually need to be pivoting maybe even a different direction than i thought i needed to 3 months ago to adapt to where my team's at and where the market is right now yeah and you know and i'm not I don't always have the answers either, and I'm always willing to listen to people uh, like yourself. And and I think that's one of the things that that uh, HPBA provides us, especially sitting on the national board. We get to be in proximity with some of the most influential people in this industry, yeah. and get to ask questions of people that a lot of you know people in our situation don't get to ask those questions of. I think um, that's helped me with my humility of saying, "Hey, I, you thought that was the way this needed to go down, but." Maybe it's got to be a completely different way. Maybe you, maybe you're th- over, you're overthinking this or underthinking this uh, on, on some aspects. And um, I, I think there's one thing is you just said the busy season, and and I really have come to the thing where I don't think you you should be worried about the busy season in the busy season. You yes. need to be worried about quarter one. Right now, we got to be worried about January first, not December first. Hundred percent. The work we do for December takes place in July. Yeah, it really does, and, it, and it's it's being that um, uh, we're doing that with every single person in our organization is that forecasting that that realization that hey, let's not wait for the door to swing in. Let's let's make sure we're making phone calls and we're the, yep. we're going out and seeing people. That's kind of the things we're working on is just being proactive to those type of things. Yeah, hundred percent. I love that. Well, okay, so Pete, the reason I wanted to have you on the show today, I, I love that you talked about that you sit on the national board and 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 I do too, and that's something that's been an immense privilege. And, and frankly, when I when I got onto the board, I did not realize what a responsibility and what a big deal it was until sitting in those meetings and you're looking at like these titans of the industry that are sitting at the table with you 
And you're all trying to come together and figure out how do we grow and protect our industry as a whole. It's, it's humbling. But I want to have you on because of where you sit. I think that you've got a lot of influence and a lot of insight into different manufacturers and different channels of the industry. Like you talked about, you have a sense of retail, of builder, of commercial, of distribution, and then also of seeing things at the manufacturer level. I want to have a conversation about where our industry is at right now. And and before I make you the bad guy, I'll come out and say it. <laughs> I I think in general, and maybe this is because of like the downturn of, of 2008 and people having to fight you know, tooth and nail for market share and companies went out of business and got bought out, wh- whatever it is. Oh. I think that our industry has become very divisive in that many companies, retailers, distributors, manufacturers are like holding on tight fisted to what's theirs. And obviously you got to make sure that your company stays in business, but I think this is being done to the detriment of our industry as a whole. I want to tee you up to, to talk about that. Yeah, I think Tim, it's a, it's a great spot because, uh, being independent we're, we, we don't represent ex- one manufacturer. You know, we have several different manufacturers that we sell. Um, in my line of work with, you know, being a distributor and then, and here it's been different lines and, and I've got to meet a lot of different manufacturers and on those one-on-one conversations with those manufacturers, they'll open up and say, Hey, I think you're right on these things. But when it gets into a public forum, sometimes they pull back a little bit and, and they need to sometimes I, I understand their position, but I think what I was amazed with him is you and I, our opinions are sought out on that board in that boardroom by some of those manufacturers and some of the other distributors we're asked all the time because uh, there's like three or four of us that are really kind of the independent people in the room that can actually, you know, say a little bit more than representing one company. Sure. And uh, we've heard some, some conversations like, well, we've done this or we've tried this and, you know, don't go there. And I think we have to, as individuals, we, we look around at each other and we say, well, why not go there? Why not readdress it? Just because it's been addressed and and either was thumbs up or thumbs down at one point in time, if that conversation's relevant again, it should be talked about. Yeah. It should be relevant to have the conversations in the, especially that room, yeah. of where we stand as a organization and as an industry. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely with you, and I think that you know. As you sit back and look at it, there has been so much disruption in the last 10 years. So I think that's one thing coming out of the economic downturn of the mid to late 2000s is there's been all kinds of disruption on the tail end of it. So like, you know, the iPhone started to change everything and started to disrupt the normal flow of life that people had. We've seen Uber disrupt the cab industry. We've seen Amazon just dominate in pretty much whatever market is decided to go after. And and it's not just digital companies too. I mean, you look at like Grubhub and home home delivery services. I mean, you know, I've got my local Fred Meyer. I mean, I guess you could say this is digital, but you know, Fred Meyer is like a Kroger grocery store, and they right. now I can, I can call ahead and have my groceries shopped for me and put in bags ready for me to pick up. It only cost me five extra dollars to have them do right. that and to go pick. Up. It's crazy, like you know. So what we're seeing is there's been a disruption in in nearly every industry and consumer behavior is wildly starting to change. But in the hearth industry, we're not talking about it. And, And the way that I feel is I feel like we're standing on the edge of a precipice where we're seeing disruption happen in every other channel of people's buying habits. But we're saying it's not going to happen to us. It's not going to happen to us. We're different. We're unique. We're special. I don't think that's true. Right, and I agree, Tim, um, wholeheartedly. I think you were one of the first people I've, I, I heard, and when you came and especially spoke to Rocky Mountain, and we talked about making it simple. And some of the, the key things were, why are we talking about BTUs? Why are we confusing the customer at every single turn? And it is hard. Now, putting a fireplace in is difficult. That's kind of why we can keep Amazon Absolutely. out of uh, our hair. but. We also got to understand that the customer is going to purchase the same way they do on Amazon. Yeah. They still want it quickly. They still want 
you know, four or five options and that's it. Yep. Uh, they still want it to look the way that they want it to look. Then they're like, click it, buy it now. Don't waste any more time. Again, what you were talking about, like every single decision is made that way. I, I do it daily. Yep. Daily, I make some decision to make my life a little bit easier and to gain three to five minutes of my life back. Yep. Um, I can do a group text instead of calling three people. Yeah. Um, I can, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that our industry is not considering how to make that change. Yeah. I, I think it's it's make a fireplace and we'll redesign this and we'll do a different brick kit, but we haven't really considered, hey, how can I make this the easiest product to put in my home? Yeah, and, and I guess so So circling back on this, I, I want to keep this conversation focused because I think we have to keep in the back of our minds this disruption has happened. It's only a matter of time before we start to see it disrupt us unless we're willing to disrupt ourselves. So right. I, I think that, and, and you know, the, the first half of this conversation is, is really talking about the problem, which is that I feel like in a, in a lot of different ways, there are many companies in our industry, and this is at every level. I mean, I'm, I'm not picking on manufacturers or retailers or distributors. It's at every level, there's many companies that are not getting involved. They are holding their cards to themselves because they've been fine so far. But yeah. I think that's to the detriment of the industry coming together and figuring out what we're going to do to stay relevant. Absolutely. And I think that we have to come together. We have to, as an industry, realize we're, we definitely have to pull together and have a plan. Yeah. Some idea, some sort of concept that we are are, are realizing. I, you've heard me say that the EPA is not our enemy. No. The EPA is the people who legitimize what we sell. Yep. They are the ones. And yeah, the, the 2020 uh, in SPS has been a challenge. I, I know that there's been some manufacturers that are, are, are suffering because of it. And, 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 I, and obviously from an industry point, I, we hate that they're suffering from those. But one of the things is people want clean burning product. And we and we can provide that. Nobody else is making that. Yeah. We are the solution. Like I, I tell you that all the time. We're part of the solution. We're not part of the problem. Nobody else is making those things. And I love your highlighting the EPA 2020 stuff because the what everybody can get behind is we all want clean air. Now we might right. disagree a little bit in the best way to get there, but like we're all behind the same objective. And I, I love that you said the EPA legitimizes what we sell, and that and that's true. But but even rewinding back to when NSPS started, there. There are things where I, I believe, I'm just speaking frankly, like if more of the industry would have been active from the beginning, I think that the outcome could have been different. Chris Neufeld when, you know, sits on a lot of the committees and everything that we sit around. And how many did he say actually got involved and how many people actually replied back for it? Was it, it was six, I believe. Oh, was, I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to go find this and, and read it to you. The apathy was off the charts from this industry from a guy trying, all he's trying to do is put it in front of Congress of what are what we need, and we couldn't even get people to give him an answer of what we need. Yeah, Pete, I'm I'm so glad that you brought up Chris Newfeld and in all the work that he did, and and this is an example. So, uh, Chris, you know, he may not want this published, but I, I think it's worth saying that 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 guy, man, he busted it to help so many manufacturers. Honestly, when his company was in the best position of anybody, but right. he was looking out for everybody else, trying to to move this thing along and to get the word out. So when when EPA finally came down with the uh, final appeal for comment. Retailers had the opportunity to send in a letter. And basically, EPA asked six questions of retailers. And and I'm going to summarize the letter that Chris sent me. So, so Chris sent a thank you letter saying that he read through every single letter that was submitted by hearth companies. So EPA asked six questions, and Chris said that he read through every single one. 41 hearth companies signed a form letter provided to them by a manufacturer that did not answer even one of the EPA's questions. Okay. 41 dealers. They signed yep. a letter that didn't answer any of the questions. On the other hand, he said, you were one of 13 that managed to provide meaningful input or address all six of EPA's questions. Our industry estimates the place that the total number of retailer locations that sell solid fuel appliances is around 3,400 of which about 50% are HPBA member retailers. With only 0.003% of retailers commenting, we did not have a strong united message. That is the understatement of the decade. Absolutely. You think about it. The reason we don't have sell-through 
is our own darn fault. 100%. We, it's our fault. It's our fault. It's our fault for not being involved, not being present, and, le- and letting somebody else is going to take care of it. Somebody yes. else is going to do it. And, and this, is not to, this is not to undercut what HPBA does. Because if you look at what HPBA has been doing, I mean, they've been champions of this. But, but they can't do it alone. No, if you we were on Capitol Hill, and if you walk up to Capitol Hill with Rachel or, or Ryan, and you ask them a question about this committee or that committee, they know each and every congressman. Yep. They know what committee they sit on. They know when they've been in there last time, and they know who's who's helping us, who who wants to help us but needs a co-sponsor on the other aisle, and how that affects them in their next election cycle. They know. I, I'm so impressed with with Ryan and, and Rachel oh and gosh, what they get done. But it, it, and people will point to to them and say, oh, the, you know, some of this is because they didn't do this. Or they didn't know it was us. It's it's us as the as the affiliates. It's us as the uh, company representatives. It, it's us that that sat down and sat on our hands and wouldn't even type a, a, a an email. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, when that stuff was going on, I had local dealers that I asked for help with this, and they said, no, I won't help because you're writing a letter to a Democrat. And I'm like, are are you kidding me? Like what? <laughs> Like this is the person that's been elected by our state, and whether we like it or don't like it, they're the Absolutely. only ones that have a say in this. Yeah, our our local senator here, and and uh, uh, is a Democrat, and we have one Republican senator and one Democrat senator, and both offices were very very willing to talk to us about a national uh, stove changeout program. Yeah. Both of them saw value in it for their constituency. Yep. It wasn't one way or the other, and I think everybody has this opinion, especially heading into a, a presidential election yeah. cycle. But if you walk into the office, if you take the time to say hi, I, you know, I, I'm Pete Schoenfeld. I'm with Rocky Mountain Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association, and I want to talk to you about some tax credits for people in our area and a national stove changeout that I think will help. They listen to you every single time. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll get back to our interview with Pete Schoenfeld in just a minute. Hey, if you've been listening to the podcast for most of this season, you've heard me talking about the fact that most websites in our industry are leaking money. But today, I want to tell you a story about what happens when you have a website that's working. So a while back, a lady named Emily went on to a Hearth dealer's webpage. Now, this dealer's website was actually set up to ask her a series of questions and based on those responses, generate a customized estimate for Emily. So Emily goes online, she's able to figure out what scenario she has, answer some questions, and she gets sent a range of what to expect to pay based on her type of application. Now, the next step from there is that Emily actually scheduled an in-home visit with this company all from their website. So a team member goes out to Emily's house and they're able to go take pictures and measurements and confirm everything that was on the online bid. So the team member asks Emily if she wants to come into the store and see the product firsthand and Emily says, no, can you just send me a video of what it looks like? So the team member goes back to the store, turns on the fireplace, lets it warm up, takes a video for 10, 11 seconds, sends it over to Emily via text message, and later that afternoon, Emily calls in a deposit for that product. Guys, your website should be making you money and giving customers a digital experience just like Emily had to clearly and easily understand what would work in her home and what a basic price range for that would be. It might seem intimidating, but I'm telling you, there are simple steps you can take to patch the holes in your website. So to learn more, I've put together a free video series that goes over three pitfalls companies make with their website, and then it explains what you need to do to take control and to patch those holes so that your website starts working for you and not against you. Now, to get that free video series, go to your website is leakingmoney.com. That's your website is leakingmoney.com. It's time to patch the holes in your website and start connecting with customers who want to buy your products. So, okay, so let's think about this. So if, if we look at how our industry could have handled the EPA 2020 stuff differently, right? That's in the rear view mirror. There's nothing that can yep. be done about that. Yep. What's, what is in the present now that we have to be thinking about is the drop in incidence rate. So we yeah. talked about this back in season one when I had VP Berger on. And an incidence rate for people that are listening and not familiar with it is the rate at which 
fireplaces are being installed into new construction homes. And that rate has been falling significantly. And we, and we looked at this data back in late October in Washington, D.C. at the national board meeting. And this is a yeah. big deal. And, and basically, if you look at it, over the last, I forget what it was, I think, I think it was like 15 years roughly, the incidence rate has fallen from about 60% to 45%, meaning that whenever the data started, I, I want to say it's like 2003, 2004, but anyway... 60% of new construction right. homes that were built had a fireplace. That number has dropped to 45%, which means that one quarter of the combined market share in new construction homes is gone. So it's not like your competitor's fireplace is getting in and yours isn't. It's that there's no fireplace getting in. Now, we can rant and rave about the problems that we had getting here, but this is an opportunity now where we are in the middle of another situation where it's time to start talking about this and figuring out what we can do, and now is an opportunity for our industry to come together. Absolutely. And, and Tim, one of the things that I, I think was so dramatic in that data that was put in front of us was that the home rates have gone back up, but the fireplaces didn't yeah. correlate with them. They, they, we leveled out and we stayed leveled. We didn't increase. Um, so it, does that mean as an industry, uh, fireplaces didn't mean as many, as much to people in their homes? No way. People still want fireplaces. What happened was people found a different option. Like they decided that they would just go with granite because we weren't out calling on the builders and building the value of the fireplaces back into those homes. Yeah. Um, making those calls again, we're waiting for people to come to us. Oh, it's a fireplace. You're, you're going to come to us. Yeah. Well, no, uh, there's a, there's a lot of people growing up that grew up in homes that never had a fireplace. Yep. And they don't know better. And that's, you know, I, I've heard Jack Goldman tell me that several times and I, and I, and I realized he's right. We have to get, fireplaces of some sort into these homes and we have to work very hard in everybody. There's not, I, I don't care if you're just a in, gas insert retailer, there's, this does matter to you yep. because you need to be talking about it. You may have a customer walking into your door buying from you. That's a purchasing agent at one of these big top five. Uh, you need to build the value of the, these top five builders. You have to build the value and why he's wanting that for his own home. Yep. Um, I just think that you're absolutely right. We have to get everyone involved. And this is something we still have time to work on. And yeah. if we can get everybody to rally and realize that, hey, you know, it's worth being a member um, of an affiliate. It's it's worth getting involved because I can make a difference. And, yeah. and I'm telling you, I, sometimes I want to walk into every store and just say, just give me one person. Give me one employee that can be your key guy yep. for this for, for this affiliate Everybody designate one person here because somebody in this organization is willing to, to volunteer a little bit of time and get involved. Yeah, and, and the, the incidence rate thing is so big. Sorry, sorry to cut you off and jump in, no, but no. I think it's important to talk about. So I, I go back to Bradley Hartman, who's been on this podcast before. And Bradley used to be an area purchasing manager for Pulte Homes, like huge national builder. And as we become friends and talked right. about fireplaces, he's, he's told me. I had, I had no idea about this. Like when I was a purchasing agent, why didn't anyone ever talk to me about outdoor fireplaces? I would expect them, right. you know, that, yep. that he as a purchasing agent would have seen the value, but, but the value wasn't given to him. So we can rant and rail about that, but a couple things I want to highlight, and these are ideas of how the industry could come together on this. And I think there's still ways to protect your proprietary information, but at the same time, there are things you can share for the common good to grow the industry. So, you know, you think about HHT and they have done a phenomenal job pouring money into this and trying to grow the industry. I know VP Burgers personally said like, we are trying to grow the industry. We're trying to grow incidence rate. We know other people are going to benefit from it, but it doesn't matter. We need to grow this incidence rate thing and we're willing to do what we can to make that happen. That's amazing. Um, you know, you look at what uh, the Schroeders have done and Napoleon with the hotspot study. An yep. amazing study that they're giving out. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing that presentation given at affiliate meetings where only a quarter of the people are Napoleon dealers, but they're saying, look, this is for the good of the industry. You have to understand that customers want fireplaces in their houses. Yeah, Tim, I, I, we give hotspots. I, I personally give the hotspots presentation to designers and architects and, 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 you know, any group we can get together because it is so important. Um, you know, they, that was a completely done for the betterment of the industry uh, and giving it out. That's why it's been the keynote um, address, it, it, you know, and we've had Dave Brown there and everybody else that was involved in it. And I believe it can't just be, though, in my estimation, just the top 
two yeah. or three manufacturers. I, I think that, it, you know, there's such a, a, a spot for some of the smaller manufacturers. They're still so relevant yeah. and their products have, totally. like we talked about before, they have a place for the customer. Yep. They need to have a voice too. And, and I think sometimes they, people think, well, if it's not this low end fireplace, it's not going to get in one of these houses. And I got to tell you, you know, that's actually not happening as we've actually taken the time to go in. And, and by the way, I, I love that Bradley gave us this walk in with the ask. Yeah. Know what you're going to ask me for, yeah. because that has helped me. Because I've walked in and I've asked the question, "Why don't you put fireplaces in these houses?" Yeah. And it's opened the discussion, and it gave me, "Why don't you put an outdoor fireplace in?" And now I can ask that question because Bradley's like gave me the authorization to walk in oh, and I feel comfortable it. asking that. <laughs> so I've done it, and, and it works. Walking into those offices, and you know what, calling up and getting that appointment, you know, um, Bradley said, you know, if you come in and you're wasting his time. He's going to get you out of there. But if you go in with some talking points, and that's one of the things that the manufacturers that you represent can help you with. Yeah. That's the bridge between the manufacturer and us as dealers and distributors is those talking points can be consistent. And those do branch out and can interweave uh, and, and create a better basket for all of us by getting the talking points to be consistent. Yeah. And then let, and then let us let the, let the product weigh out the market and who's going to win it. You know, the person's going to give that account the most attention and, and take care of them the best is going to win those jobs. Yeah, uh, we we see a lot of growth because we're dedicated to yep. to that segment, and I, I think that we really do have to be aware, Tim, that if we don't get that rate to start increasing, we're going to be so limited in the future what we have in these houses. Um, yeah. So I, I agree. I, I love that you, you set that up, but it's it's a perfect uh, segment there. Yeah, and this is the time to do it. You know, even at your local affiliate level. So we've talked about manufacturers, and, and there's other manufacturers that are working towards this besides HHT and Napoleon. Those are just the two right. front runners that have really championed this issue. But if you look at the retailer level too. You know, what What could we be doing at our local affiliates? Like, what if retailers that competed against each other could come together and talk about, hey, we need fireplaces to get specced more. How could we attack this together to go grow our industry at building events, to get in front of people? I mean, this is something that obviously everybody wants their piece of the pie. But when when you're looking around and, like, the, the boat is sinking, man, you, you stop worrying about which team people in the boat are on. You start plugging holes together. Yeah, we all want to be alive, right? We all want to survive. And I, I think that one of the things I, I found about being a member of the HPBA and especially affiliate like Rocky Mountain is I do have the ability to have a dialogue with my competitors. Yeah. I, I can talk to – I know them personally. I can say, hey, you know, so-and-so – this is what happened here, and, and um, are, were you aware that was going on in our territory? Did you realize this uh, builder was optioning out fireplaces altogether? And we can actually have a conversation, and it's okay if we both call on that purchasing agent because at least then they heard twice that there's fireplaces available for the home, and it brings the value and close rate ratios up. Totally, Hotspots proves that. Yeah. You know, it, it, the, the data is there if we get it in front of them like, like you did with Bradley. Yeah, so so I, I wonder, and I think a, a little while ago, HHT actually hosted a summit, I think, for a number of manufacturers to come in to start talking about the incidence rate issue. And I think that we we need to start bridging those gaps between competitors. And, and I'll tell you for me, like I'll tell you two stories for me personally. So one of them is that uh, we have stores up in Seattle, and we have a direct competitor up there in Seattle called Sutter Hearth and Home. They're an amazing business. They do just terrific work. And Daniel Hammer, who owns Sutter, we've connected through the podcast. He's become a good friend of mine. And we are competitors, right? We, we sell in the same territory, and I'm, I lose jobs to him. I'm sure he loses jobs to me. But there is a mutual respect and trust that we've built for each other in the way that we approach business that has actually turned into a friendship to where yeah. you know there's certain things we keep to ourselves, but we can share openly and honestly about what we're seeing in the marketplace. And and this is not like, we don't have to worry about like antitrust or anything. We're not getting into right. like price fixing or anything like that. But but it it is so beneficial to have open lines of communication with people that you respect, that are worthy rivals that you you compete against and, and you both are better for it. You know, I've I've found that to be an immense blessing in the Seattle market. So in the Portland market, my old boss, Scott Ongley at Lysak's Fireplaces, he's a competitor of mine now. And same thing, you know, he beats me on jobs, I beat him on jobs sometimes and like 
hey, that's that's what business is, right? We're, we're it's made the best salesperson right. win. But when it comes time to go to Washington D.C. to testify, yep. who is shoulder to shoulder with me testifying to Congress people about what their constituents need? It's me and Scott Ongley, competitors side by side. Yep. We had an awesome day together, and it's been funny actually. I feel like we're, we're talking a lot of times how the industry as a whole seems to still be very segmented. We've actually found, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, as regulation has kind of started to force our hand, we're actually starting to see something special happen with dealers coming together in a way that I haven't seen before, which is really cool. And we had that here in Rocky Mountain with Utah when they were looking at doing the wood burning ban. And the dealers came together. Rocky Mountain was able to help with funding uh, out there. And, and and we came together and some graduates of uh, the Tom Pugh Government Affairs Academy were out there, you know, talking in front of the media, rallying people up. And it was – it's so amazing. Yeah, I, I saw the pictures of you and Scott on your Lime scooters. So, <laughs> you know, that was I, – I think that, that, that shows you just how well it can um, – bridge that gap. Yeah, absolutely. And and honestly, man, like, so here's the way that I look at this. So, so I'm a big fan of this thing that's called the Gallup Strengths Finders test. And, you know, they ask you a bunch of questions and, and they give you your top five personality strengths. So on the Gallup Strengths Finders personality test, my number one personality strength is competition. It's my number wow. one out of, out of everything. And, and that, and that suits me the way that I, I have I have been designed for competition, whether it's athletics, sales, reading, like whatever it is, I want to win. Now, I think a big thing is, as I've hopefully matured over the years, me winning does not mean that other people always have to lose. And, Absolutely. And the way that I look at this is I look at it like a basketball game, right? So if if you're watching, I think about LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, right? So they spent some time on the same team, but you know what? They actually spent time on different teams too. So like if you look at LeBron and D. Wade, when they are playing each other, dude, it's made the best basketball team win, and I am going to use all of my skills to win, period. I'm, I'm going to do that. Like, I'm playing within the rules, but I'm using my skills to win. But you look at what happens after the game. Who's going to dinner together, right? In the summer, who's working out together, sharpening each other? Like, mm-hmm. that's, in my opinion, that is what business should be. And, and, and that speaks to the idea. Simon Sinek talks about finding a worthy rival, and I think that yep. makes everybody better. It does. It, it, it absolutely does. And so our common goal needs to be coming together to save this industry, to get our incident rates up, to get us all working in the same, you know, it's a, the Patrick Linsconi, uh rowing in the same boat, right? Yep. We have all got to get rowing in the same direction. Yep. Yeah, we really do. We really do. And, and I think it's funny, you know, talking about EPA, which is in the rearview mirror, we've got incidence rate, which is happening right now. I mean, it w- would have been nice to be more active 15 years ago, but but right now we can still do something. We can still work on this. But you look at, you know, what are the things that haven't happened yet that we can see on the horizon where we can start to be proactive on this? You know, I, I think a lot about um, this whole digital experience that like we have to be able to bridge this digital gap because we're seeing signs in every other sector. It hasn't happened to us yet. But the two questions that we have to face is, is if, it, if it doesn't happen, one, are we going to fade into oblivion because we're too hard to buy from and just slowly, bit by bit by bit, lose more and more and more? Or B, is someone else going to figure it out that's not interested in specialty retailer surviving? Yeah, and that is the the real danger, right? Is is It's the status quo won't get us to where we need to be. And, and it's not going to protect the company by staying the status quo. I think that's the mindset that might get a little lost him is I think they think staying the same, I'm protected. No, as a matter of fact, you're just putting yourself on the extinction list. You're, 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 you have to make this move. You have to get better. Uh, you know, most of the people walking in, they tell us, they, I went to this page, I went to Google and I typed this, I looked at your five-star reviews. Uh, I read about you. They built the trust. They know the product they walk in more educated than they've ever been. Oh, yeah. But if you don't have those tools in place, you have no hope yep. whatsoever. Yep. And and that's the truth is that customers, I mean, this is like preaching to the choir from this podcast, but, but customers get their information from the web and there's some good and some bad. Some of it applies to their situation. Some doesn't, but whether we like it or not, they've got a head full of information when they come into the showroom and we get the decision of turning that into confusion or clarity. That's the decision that we yep. get to, that we get to do. 
Yeah, as soon as as soon as and we've done it, and you know it's funny, Tim. I've really worked on this this year after talking to you yeah. at, at Rocky Mountain at the affiliate meeting. I've worked on understanding the client's need when they walk in, and then giving them one or two options. Yeah. And man, my close ratio is skyrocket because I'm not confusing them. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've mentioned the word BTU yeah. unless they brought it up. Yep. Because it doesn't matter. I say, look at that giant, nice, beautiful orange flame. Is that what you want? Yes. Okay. That check that box. That's right. On to the next thing. That's right. Perfect. You got eighteen hundred <laughs> square feet. This size will work perfect for you. Like, don't tell yeah. me to use this size. Will work perfect for you. <laughs> this will work perfectly in this application. Your vent's going to look just like that, and yeah. we're good to go. Yeah. Want to pay for it now or later? <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's awesome. And we, we could talk about this for days. But as yeah. we round out here, you know, I, I, I number one, I appreciate your friendship and the insight that you that you bring to the table, especially on the national board. I think that you're a voice that is is needed and and respected on the board, but. For people listening to this, whether you're young or old, age doesn't matter, but who are thinking like, what should I do, right? So, so in many ways, our industry is segregated, right? And there's, there's a lot of companies almost like tribes in a warring nation. They're holding on to their own. If we're trying to take the first step to bridge some gaps and grow the industry, what would you do? I, I honestly think you got to designate somebody to to get involved, not just one person. Some more, you know, is it somebody at each location? You have several locations. Yeah. I have several locations. Do I designate a person at each location to get involved in the affiliates to start to take some of the younger crowd that we're hiring that are so talented and so knowledgeable and have a whole different way of thinking and and get them into our meetings and our events locally and then hopefully nationally. You yeah. know, I I think you got to get that. If somebody's listening to this and they want to be involved and they're in our area or whatever else, any of the affiliates, reach out to your affiliates because we're always looking to add people. We're always looking to get people on the local boards that that have a different opinion. We're not looking for the status quo. We're looking for for younger, fresher ideas. And you you would have a voice at the table. Yeah, just get involved. Just make the phone call. I love it. That's that's really good. Yeah, I, I think I think our industry it, it's so easy when you've had success to start to get tunnel vision to, to what got you there. And, and I, I do not want to disrespect what has made some of the big companies and retailers and distributors successful because, man, amazing, like more power to you. But I think that what we have to be thinking about is, is the title of that book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Right. And, and, and that's really the truth, that, that we have to be thinking differently. I know, I know for me personally, it's... It's easy to surround yourself with people that tell you yes, that tell you, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Um, it's hard to find people that will speak the truth and will push back against you, especially when you have a strong personality. Like, I mean, you have a strong personality, right? You're passionate and I'm the same thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things for me is like when I'm thinking about new business ideas, trying to actively seek out people who I know will disagree with me to point nope. out the flaws in my thinking that I am blind to and hopefully having yeah. the humility to listen to it. Like that's the way that a good idea becomes a great idea. That's why those rooms are so important because they are represented by so many different opinions and diversity and all these different manufacturers. They all have a different point. They all have at the end of the day, their, the return that they want for their companies. But you can feel the good or great coming to the top. You can feel that the industry is important as a whole. And, and Tim, that's one of the reasons I think we've always hit it off is because I feel like we've always realized it's bigger than you and I. Yeah. Uh, we definitely can't do it on our own. And I think our passion comes across because – even during this conversation, what we're really looking for is we're looking to rally the troops. Yeah. We're looking to add it. anybody and everybody who wants to get involved. We want you there. We want to show you how to get there. You and I were able to to move to those tables and, and do those things and, and 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 get to the national level. I'm I'm looking for the people who want to be right behind us to fill those seats when when we're vacated yeah. and and they're the next voice and and I want to see this industry continue on for for as long as we can possibly go. Yeah. And that's something that that really has hit me and and maybe it's because, you know, I'm I'm on the young side but I, you know I'm, I'm approaching 15 years in the industry and so I've got right. a little bit of time under my belt. 
And 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 I've, I've realized that like I, I've fallen in love with the industry, war, warts yeah. and all. And it's one of those things like, man, when, the closer you are to something, the more you're able to criticize it. And 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 very often it's, it's because you you love it so much, right? And you're able to see like the good, the bad, and, and the ugly, right? I mean, this we yeah. we all know the same things about like our own lives. Like we we know the good, bad, and the ugly with it. But right. I I think it's important to realize that this is an amazing industry that provides livelihoods for all kinds of people and makes an unbelievable product that is transformational in the homes of our customers. And I think it's worth fighting for and I think it's worth holding on to. And so for someone who's listening to this, what, what I keep thinking about is I I guess I, I I think about myself when I was like 22 and I'd, I'd been installing for about four years and I just moved into a sales role. And I remember on the affiliate calls being like, what's the purpose of this? Like, why do I go to these breakfast meetings? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I think it's be- like, we could have done a better job of explaining the big picture of like, this is what an HPBA affiliate is. Mm-hmm. This is what they do. And this is why it's really important to be involved. We probably could have done a better job of that. And I think that, you know, if you're listening as an affiliate leader, take notes on, on being crystal clear and explaining that to new members and, and at the beginning of your meetings and things like that. But for me, I think there was also an immaturity of thinking like, what's in it for me now? And and the yep. truth is that, that, if if you're asking what's in it for me now, the answer is probably nothing. But if you ask what's in it for me in 10 years, I, I think that there's a lot. Yes, absolutely, Tim. I, mean, I think everybody, I, I know I got that. If, if, if uh, like I said before, if Pete Dines hadn't been on the board, I probably never would have got a f- involved in the HPBA. Watching him be involved and watching uh, the issues that he was bringing up in our discussions, it, it, it spurred on me wanting to do that 10 years later, 12 years later, when I had the opportunity, I jumped at it because that's, I, I saw that ability to get involved in, and, and you're right. You, you gotta, you gotta just make the jump. You yeah. just really have to. And I, and it's, it's deeply, uh, rewarding. I, I tell you, it's, it's, it's probably one of the most rewarding things I've done in my career is be involved in HPBA and get to meet everybody and, and, and get exposed to people that I definitely would not get exposed to just staying in my little cocoon of the showrooms and, and, and our own little thing with our own little manufacturers. So it, it, it's, uh, it really broadens your horizons. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. And, and I think that there is some truth to the fact that like, a lot of the work that you're doing for HPBA, quote unquote, like doesn't make you money. I mean, in the long run, I actually think it does. But man, the insight that you gain from rubbing shoulders with some of the people that you're rubbing shoulders with and like getting to go to a dinner and hear about something in manufacturing that all of a sudden triggers for you. Oh my gosh, that relates exactly to the way that we do installs. If we change, like I'm, I'm telling you, like when you start to invest in broadening your horizons and thinking mm-hmm. bigger, dude, good things happen. They do. Yeah. There's great people in this industry. Uh, you know, you've exposed us a lot of your listeners and a lot of your fans to so many different people. I, I know I follow uh, TR on oh, in, yeah. and LinkedIn, and so I get his quotes every day. And uh, you know, I've had some back and forth with him, and 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 getting exposed to people like Tim that I would never have had that if you hadn't given us that platform to hear these things and and to realize that I would never have had that. Yeah, well, and and I think about that with the podcast. I mean, I I want this podcast to be a gift for the industry for however long it, it lives on. I want it to be a gift because I think what it shows is that there are people at every level, at every company, and in virtually every role that have something to say that's worth listening to. And, and I hope that that's highlighted that in having everybody from like presidents of companies to local installers that I compete with to, I mean, like it doesn't matter what role you're in, there is something that you can bring to the table for the good of the industry. Yeah, absolutely, Tim. That is as well said, and that's a great capsule of, of of this whole conversation. Is you know, open mindedness, transparency. That's where it all started, right? For you and I, yep. and 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 this whole thing. I, I think if we could give that gift of saying, "Hey, try to open a conversation and dialogue with somebody you haven't, or somebody maybe you've always wanted to," I, I think that people would be really surprised at how open and honest and transparent people would be with them. Whether it's a manufacturer you've never worked with before, maybe that's the call you should make to say, "Hey." I just want to introduce myself. I think you're great. I follow you on here and I think your content is amazing. You know, that kind of thing. Yep. I'm absolutely with you. Well, Pete, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and I, I got to thank you for what you're doing for the industry. It's it's awesome to see and I know it's making a difference. Well, thank you, Tim. And I can say that right back to you. It's, it applies to definitely right back to you. Oh, thanks, man. Well, we'll see you later. Okay. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Pete. Oh, man, I loved getting the chance to talk to him. And I think that we hit some very authentic and honest things to think about regarding the way that we work together as companies and what we need to be doing to grow into the future landscape of business. So if there's one thing to take away from what Pete said, it's that you have to get involved. I mean, like I mentioned at the end of that interview, if you ask what's the return on investment for getting involved with HPBA, well, right now it's zero. But if you're planning on being this industry and you ask what's the ROI in 10 years, I'm not joking when I tell you it is off the charts. I've experienced this firsthand and I know that you can too. Now, HPBA is a national organization, but it's broken up into smaller affiliate groups all over North America. And I'm telling you, if you're not involved in this, there's going to be a link in the show notes that you can click to find your affiliate send that director an email and say, hey, I want to get involved. Honestly, it doesn't take that much time, but I'm telling you that over the course of a few years, this will grow you like not many other things will. I truly believe that we are on the cusp of a shift and things will not go back to the way that they used to be. I mean, we talked about all this disruption that's happened everywhere and guys, it's coming, but it's something that we can choose to lead the charge in ourselves or hide in our shells and be swept away. It's up to us. Now, before we go, one last announcement that I want to give you is the first episode of season four is going to be live from the HPB Expo in New Orleans. Now, this episode is going to be with myself, Steven Schroeder, who's one of the co-CEOs of Napoleon and Grant Falco. And I'm telling you, the topic is going to be amazing. Now, we're still working out the date and the time because HPBA is trying to work this into the calendar of events. So stay tuned on that. But just know if you're going to be at the trade show, there will be the opportunity to come and see a live episode of this podcast. And also, don't forget, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, to come to the podcast meetup. That's going on in New Orleans. It's going to be Wednesday, March 11th from 5 to 6 p.m. at the Public Belt. And to RSVP, you can go to itsfiretime.com slash meetup. That's itsfiretime.com slash meetup. Well, once again... I was really encouraged by this episode as I talk about these things. It gives me hope just because I talk to so many of you in different pockets of the country that are trying to do the right thing. And, And while generally speaking, I do believe there's a lot of our industry that has it backwards. I truly believe that we are creating a movement that is going to turn this industry upside down in the best way possible. So with that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. I can't wait to talk to you next week in the Q&A episode to put a bow on season three. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. To learn more, visit the website itsfiretime.com. Music from this episode was written and recorded by In Bloom out of Portland, Oregon. We thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough slow is fast and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to we'll see you next time